Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 574. A science Faction, value the P and poison makeup. Value the P and poison makeup. This... This sounds like a Chuck Palahniuk novel. Yeah, there's uh, yeah, there's also a lot of like unneeded violence and really grotesque scenes in this one as well. Yeah, I didn't think the book had to describe a fisting scene as in depth as it yeah. did, but uh, Chuck Palahniuk's an artist. What can we do? And also, like getting Helen Bonham Carter to play the role really did fit. <laughs> By the way, like I like how like uh, has he not written any more books? Did he just like kind of just shock the world and like the world just was like no more, Mister Palahniuk. No, he actually had a really funny thing where he accidentally outed himself, uh, where like an, a reporter he thought had found out he was gay, and he thought that that reporter was going to out him in this piece he was working on, and Palin Huck like called up and left like a threatening message like, ah, screw, how dare you screw you, and then ended up like, I think outing himself in that whole like, well, you can't out me if I out myself thing. Mm-hmm. And then the article came out and it said nothing about him being gay. <laughs> so he like, Yeah, I remember that story. And so is that what kind of uh, caused him to, you know, I respect some, I respect somebody who does something like that. And then has the, the humility to step back and yeah. say, you know what? I'm going to step back. Oh, uh, and speaking of humility, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. And with me, is, as always, is the master of humility, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm like the anti-humility master. Like, I regularly make a fool of myself, and instead of gracefully bowing out of this podcast, Mm -hmm. I have remained. I thought you meant anti-humility as in, like, if you ever meet somebody who has a lot of humility and you touch them, both of you would annihilate one another in a large explosion. Uh, Yes, that is is exactly the way the world works. (laughs) No, really, it is. That's not a joke. (laughs) Now, here's my question. Because, you know, uh, doesn't that theory suggest that there is a dark matter version of us or a dark a dark matter version of things or possibility? No, it doesn't. You don't need an anti-matter version of things. It just means when anti-matter and matter touch each other, they annihilate. Just like you don't need like ice and anti-ice. Like you could just have fire and it would, you know. But, yeah, anyway. but a universe could be made of anti-matter, right? Yes, correct. And they would know they're the evil universe. They're not the evil universe. They're <laughs> just, just not the way I understand. <laughs> Listen, Bobby, as, as somebody who comes, all of my science training comes from comic books. Which okay. Tells me. Question number three. What is it about antimatter that makes you grow a beard? <laughs> what is it? What does this baby have a beard? Oh, my God. I'm in the anti-universe. <laughs> Boom, right then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. God help you if you ever fall asleep and wake up in Armenia and you just think. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I haven't detonated everybody. I just must be in Armenia. Okay. Uh, let's move right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is science article. Okay, maybe this is an ungoogleable question, or maybe this is, uh, but let's just say, Bobby, all of a sudden, I snapped my fingers and transported you, Robert uh-huh. Timothy, yeah. to the uh, antimatter universe. Yes, the, 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 the antimatter universe, which is, of course, filled with people with beards because they're evil. Yes, but I mean, okay. but as we Fair know enough. on this show, you would never get to experience that because the second you came into contact with all this antimatter, right. how big would the Bobby bomb be? How big would the radius of the Bobby bomb? You know what? I, I'm going to say this just like from a scientific standpoint. I actually think it would not be a, a big explosion. I think there'd be no explosion at all because I think I have the personality to get along even with the antimatter universe. That just means you have no morals. You're sellout. You fucking, you'll betray us and sell our secrets. <laughs> no, I just carry around a box of Just for Men beard oil. <laughs> that seems to do it. <laughs> <laughs> all right article number one significant damage i would like to by the way uh if if, if a fan were to write that same question in he'll take it seriously and we could use it for a segment so. 
<laughs> yes, that's what I... Fans, do you have questions about the presence or absence of beards in a theoretical antimatter <laughs> universe? I warn you, be very specific in your wording of the question to avoid shit like this. Pretend, as Bobby uh, has stated, that it, you just found a magical lamp. Bam, you rub it, a genie comes out. Your first wish needs to be for a genie lawyer. You always ask for the genie attorney first. That's the only way you're going to get treated well in, in genie court. Assume that the genie you are going up against is malevolent and is looking to give you cursed wishes. When you write your questions, your uh, ask Bobby an ungoogleable question, which, by the way, we are always uh, taking submissions for for uh, looking for the bit. So if you have any questions, uh, Bobby, would you want to describe that? No, I was just thinking of the age old adage that like even a genie attorney who acts as their own attorney has a fool for a client. <laughs> The ability to reshape reality means nothing in the court of law. <laughs> oh, dear. So, sig- article number one, significant damage. So, this is a fantastic article available on Science News right now, and it's called How the Strange Idea of Statistical Significance Was Born. I think this is an amazing article. I have actually done a bunch of research into the idea of p-values and statistical significance. and um, you know, kind I've of- seen your Pornhub searches, yeah. I know. It's all P-related, and some of it is research. <laughs> How come everybody's a BBW, though? That's Statistically, it seems like you're using a very specific, a very specific uh, sample group. No questions on search history. All right, so, <laughs> so what is that when we talk about statistical significance or P-value? You might have heard, I, I say it on this show all the time, we talk about that as to whether or not things get published, whether or not we find them as significant. So what we're talking about is what is reported as the P-value or the significance. And when they say P as 05, what they're saying is the P-value is 5% or less, P.05 five or less. And what that means is when we're calculating P, technically what we're calculating is the likelihood that the results you're seeing are due to chance. So if we have, let's say we, you know, flipped a bunch of coins and they all, uh, you know, kind of went heads, tails, head, tails, and we had about 50-50 each way. And then somebody suggests, you know, I think if you flip a coin in this really specific way, you'll get only heads or you'll get heads more often. And so we start flipping in a really specific way and we do indeed see more heads. But also there's just a natural shift. Sometimes you flip four heads in a row and then you get a tails. Like that's just the way it goes. So how can you tell if that method of flipping is giving you more heads or if it's just, it just so happens to be that you were on a streak of heads when you do that. You can look at the significance. And most people just kind of say this number without understanding what it is. I'm going to give you like a real basic overview of what the p-value actually is. So when we say it is the chance likelihood that it would just happen on its own, what we're actually doing is we're just looking at the existing data set and we're saying, okay, so here is what we would expect. Here is uh, what we see. Where is what we see in terms of that statistical bell curve, if it is a bell curve, of answers? Like, where would that fall? Would it fall? I prefer an hourglass curve myself. (laughs) Yeah. Well, so if you have like a big Z score, you know, if you have a big standard deviation, what you're going to see is if you were expecting to get an average of 50 and you got 52, but your Z score is five. So, you know, you're, you're usually between 45 and 55. Well, then 52 is not that surprising. And so the chances of it being statistically significant or the chances of that happening just due to random chance with no influence whatsoever are actually really, really good. However, if you see you're you're expecting to get 50, but it's usually between 45 and 55, and you end up getting 79, well, at that point, you're, you know, uh, three Z scores away on one side, and you can look at a scale, and depending on your distribution, you could say three Z scores away, the likelihood of this happening is very, very small, like 1%. And so therefore, the chance of it happening just due to a statistical anomaly is 1%. So you are your p-value is 1. That's really good because we in science say, look, well, that's fantastic. That means the numbers seem to say that something real is happening. 
However, it doesn't say that something real is happening. All it's saying is the likelihood of this thing happening and not being attributable to the independent variable or something that we have changed in the equation, the likelihood that it just happened because it's a random part of this data set is 1%. It doesn't say anything about well how well things were controlled for. It doesn't say how well biases were accounted for. It doesn't say how honest they were in recording results. So when we say, you know, p-value is five, and that means the 5% chance that these are just due to random chance, it doesn't actually mean that. It means it's the there's a 5% chance uh, it's due to just co completely random chance just on the statistical data alone without actually getting into any of the details of the study. Damien, does that make sense? Yes, but that is only because I have an MBA, which some would argue is the highest of sciences. N nobody would argue that. Well, I mean, first off, I went to Trump University. It's a presidential university. So uh, where'd you go? Oh, President Berkeley? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what? <laughs> Anyhow, but yes, uh, we, we did have to cover p-values, uh, you know, and, and I remember Dr. Troy says uh, in physics, they have to go within like, what, three sigmas or something? Yeah, and it depends what you're doing, and it's going to depend on your data set. All of those are going to have different variables. There's no one rule in terms of what you need, and that's kind of why PO5 is like, I don't know, it's kind of like a arbitrary thing. And if you think about it, we have to, you know, there are studies that come out with, you know, P is 0.04 that are considered statistically significant and P is 0.06 that are considered not. And that is not always valid, especially because a lot of those P06 are very valid studies and they, they're, maybe they're more robust and maybe they show uh, they have better controls for, for bias and whatnot. And so they are actually showing something where that 04 isn't, but the 04 is publishable and the 06 is not. You actually described it in a way that it painted the picture really well for me. In fact, I took your example and I used uh -huh. it on another podcast uh, I was on. Uh, don't bother searching for it. It's done. But basically, I was recording with a uh, cholo and and a fr well, two <laughs> friends of ours, one of whom's a cholo. And uh, there was like people, pl kids playing Fortnite in the background. The audio is terrible. But the guy was kind of coming like and I think like he was he th because I'm on this podcast, it has <laughs> apparently gained me some science credibility, at least within people who... Uh, apparently were... they've never listened to I Call BS, but... <laughs> well, maybe they weren't Patreons, Bobby. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, the, the way you painted the picture was really good. You, uh, you were talking about how... Uh, it, we were, it was an article you were talking about how uh, there are some problems in science. And, and that one, one of them was that... The, the, what was it? The desk drawer effect... Sure. I think that one was, you know, just by statistical chance, you know, if a p-value of five, uh, one out of every 20 uh, science experiments will show results that are unexpected. Yes, just by chance. If if we are to accept p05, then 5% likelihood of uh, that result just being statistical noise, then if we did 20 experiments and one of them showed a result, well, that's exactly what we would expect from something that had absolutely no effect. Yeah, and since that's the result that is exciting, that tends to be the one that more attention is paid to. And, you know, it's... Or, it you know, yeah, it's not even just more attention. Like, you know, the the non-significant, quote-unquote, results won't be published. The non-interesting ones won't be published at all. They get filed away in the desk drawer, as you said. And then, of course, you know, the one out of 20 that is published and the one that seems to show interesting results. But if you look at the math on it, it actually is almost confirming that there is nothing interesting happening there. All right, I'm just saying that's the way I like, like, if, like, let's just say you listen to this podcast and like, hey, all that number talk, that ain't for me. Like, because it's just really, that's my style. Sure. I come to this podcast, listen to the dick jokes. Yeah. I think that way of describing it right there uh, worked for me. And I think, uh, I think helped a very uh, well-read Cholo learn a little bit more about science. <laughs> Wait, did you have your own version of stand and deliver? <laughs> no, he did me. He had to. Uh, he was teaching me about prison culture. I was going to do some time, Bobby. I'm like, I was just getting everything wrong, and he's like, "I have to reach this pervert." <laughs> so, how exactly did this even become enshrined in the scientific process? This idea of p-values. Well, post World War II, we had this idea where a bunch of humanities were trying to show themselves as being scientific. This happened in my own field of archaeology. That's where we see processual archaeology come up, and. I've had my own issues with that. And, you know, in psychology, there there was this idea of p-values that came in. Flaccid and sciences, archaeology. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, well, psychology. so they say archaeology is the most scientific of the humanities and the most humanity-like of the sciences. Uh, so I, I like to really think of them as a half-chub science. <laughs> Like you're there to impress, not to perform. Yeah, it's like, uh, wow, that's that science looks great in the shower. 
uh, when he's just, you know, just having a shower. He looks fantastic there, but he doesn't look sexually aggressive. And that's what I like about it. Yeah. And then also, like, when I keep, like, trying to engage him to get him to go full erect, he's just not reacting. He's just, which is insulting to me as somebody's peddling soft science. If you walk around with a hard science hard on, also known as a physics on, if you just walk around with a <laughs> physics on all day, you're going to intimidate the shit out of just random people. You know, it's, it's like going to be uncomfortable for everybody. But a nice half chub, that everybody can appreciate that. That does explain why Stephen Hawking uh, is rolling in it, man. That dude. <laughs> Literally rolling. Well, I mean, like, hey, you, I mean, that dude is a master of physics and he also has a lot of physical ailments. That's right. But nothing slows that man down because, again, unlike archaeology, the man studies erect sciences. Well, maybe death. But so anyway, in that post-World War II era, there was this move towards, you know, trying to make everything more scientific, more measurable, more objective. And that's where this idea of a p-value came from, from actual research journals, which I was actually not aware of. I didn't realize this in the history of some of this, is that a lot of this came from research journals trying to decide what their standards were, were going to be to make, you know, psychology seem like a scientific discipline. And that became the main standard and it then later got adopted out by a lot of other things just kind of spread out that idea of p.05 being a really important thing spread around and it's not like that really is some kind of magic number again one means one out of 20 times you would expect that you would see a result that would otherwise be surprising if you did a thing 20 times and so like it could have been point zero two five or something like that it could have been a different number it just was and it's kind of like when we decide you're an adult on your 18th birthday it's like you weren't you're not any more mature than you were at 17 years and whatever like we just have to pick a point and some people are going to be way too immature at 18 and some people will be super mature at like 14 but like we set our p-value by when statistically most science experiments can be of the most use to the military and like it leads to a lot of bs it leads to a lot of what we call things like p hacking which was when somebody's peeing and you do a karate chop and break the stream <laughs> right yeah no it's when it's when you're <laughs> peeing but like the russians have gotten involved <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I heard uh, Dimitri, Dimitri, I, when, when I'm like standing next to the urinal, next to somebody named Dimitri, apparently. <laughs> did you did you hear the phone line click when I started peeing? When stream start, did you hear the phone line? I went to go take a piss and I was about to start and then it said I need to download an Adobe update. And then I did and weird shit started happening. <laughs> and then I realized I, I was already updated on Adobe. So that was probably a fake link, huh? Yes, I, I said I needed to update the password. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of p-hacking. So if, you know, they say p.05 is so important, then what people do is look at all their data and say, well, what data can I put together to make that p.05? And then, you know, even if that isn't necessary, that might just be an anomaly. Again, if you look at 20 things, then one of them will show up as statistically significant. That isn't actually. And so, you know, they'll look for something and they'll find p.05. Sometimes it'll be like, okay, well, I don't actually have something that's statistically significant, but actually if I remove one of the variables, then all of a sudden my data does seem statistically significant because if you toy with enough numbers enough times, you will find a way to do it. And then you'd be like, well, actually, so we'll just write this experiment up as if this variable wasn't there. We'll take the, the, the data out from that variable. And now all of a sudden we have significance. So like if I rolled a D20 20 times, I should hit a natural 20 at least one time. But I could also every time it rolls off the table, I could count that as a 20. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, no, don't bring in nerd references, David. We're talking about <laughs> science and pussy here. <laughs> By the way, maybe we should change the name of the podcast. There's clearly a lot of science faction. Science pussy. Science and science pussy. Science and pussy. Science and pussy. You're like, I'm Joey Diaz. Hey. Uh, undoubtedly, this p-hacking and the search for 0.05 and statistical significance has been a huge part of everything from the replication crisis, which we've covered here, to the modernization of things like psychology and other experiments that are the result of the replication crisis, where now we're seeing pre-registered experiments. And uh, so you can't do that thing where you remove one of the variables because you see significance instead you have to tell them here's what i am going to look at and this is exactly what i'm going to evaluate and you don't know that until you collect the data and then they get the data as raw data too so that you can't kind of look through something to find it and so, so there are ways there's a swing back of the pendulum towards rightness so to speak but it is really interesting and i think in the history of science we're going to look back at this time period from like post-world war ii to now as 
this weird kind of flexing of science, quote unquote, or scientific ideas into ways that are actually not nearly as scientific as we thought. And that things like the search for statistical significance and P.05 being the definition of statistical significance is going to like be seen as a really antiquated. It's almost like how chemistry got started with alchemy. Like we're going to look back at those times. I mean, this might not be the time or place to have really what would be, I guess, a business development meeting. Mm -hmm. But if your goal is to educate people in science, if your, <laughs> if your goal is to have one guest appearance on Rogan sure. and basically show the magic of science from there, I think we have to rename the podcast Science and Pussy. Science and Pussy? Listen, it's crass. Our wives will hate it. We will certainly lose a significant number of the our legitimate science fans here. But I, I listen, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and take a, a tip from improv. And yes, Angie, on this one. Yes. And <laughs> I think we should take it a step further. I think we should go like morning radio hosts and I'm science and your pussy and it's science and the pussy. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. <laughs> I get command of my own air horn track. <laughs> it's in my rider. <laughs> And here's the thing, like, we could put out, like, little internet videos where, like, you're ranting about science from a truck. Like, here's the thing about p-values. I'm telling you, the government sets them at an arbitrary number of 0.05. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I should decide to have the freedom to set my p-values whenever I want. Can I get a hell yeah? Talk on it, pussy! <laughs> <laughs> All right, on to article number two. Maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's chemical poisoning. Bobby, I don't care. How does she look? I am as a shallow man, as the pussy, the radio DJ we talked about not more than five seconds ago. Yep. I'm going to ask, like, dude, was she a dog, homie? So, dude, that's all that matters. So in a pretty interesting article that came out this week, it turns out that a ton of makeup actually contains pretty dangerous compounds. This study specifically looked at PFAs, per and polyfluorochyl substances, and they can accumulate in our bodies and last for years. And then in the in natural environment, they can actually accumulate and last for centuries. And they're linked to health problems like thyroid disease and high cholesterol. And they seem to be especially prevalent in long lasting or waterproof makeups. Here's a quote from the Science News for Students article on it. One of the researchers was described as he was part of the team that did the first large screening for PFAS in cosmetics sold in the United States and Canada. The team tested 231 products for fluorine. This is a key part of PFAs. 52% of those products contained a high fluorine level, suggesting it contained at least one PFAS. That included 63% of foundations, 55% of lip products, and 82% of waterproof mascaras. So... Not a small amount. Not like, hey, 3% of this was found to be contaminated. It's like, no, on the fucking most of it. Most of it was contaminated. Why were we just torturing animals? Why were we spray painting this uh, lipstick fluid into a squirrel's lungs and giving rabbit suppositories with this stuff? If, like, the whole point of being cruel to animals was so our beauty could come at their expense, not ours. Well, first of all, if you think that was the whole point, you've never seen how funny it is to tag a rabbit because it is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> You're a boxer, so I assume you mean just punching a rabbit. No, no. I, I will put my, uh, my gang tag on a rabbit <laughs> sometime and watch him, <laughs> watch him jump away. It's really funny. And then, you know, it lets everybody else in town know who the big man is. <laughs> Holy shit, that's Bobby's rabbit. Run away. <laughs> Don't touch it. Don't eat that for supper. <laughs> Get off my corners. <laughs> like uh, I imagine if you went to CERN you'd be like the Omar of CERN Bobby's coming Bobby's coming people would like uh, Mensa members would say warning other Mensa members that you were rounding the corner oh uh, dear so very very interesting it's one of those things where we find that that thing that's in everything is actually hurting us it's like when we started finding out a lot of like BPA stuff in like plastic water bottles and we're like oh this is all we drink is warm plastic water bottles and this is really bad for us kind of like that with the makeup stuff so you know you know maybe this will go down as one of those like good parts of covid is like uh you know we got teleworking done mrna vaccines and less makeup poisoning because women weren't putting on makeup every single day well what are the effects thyroid issues was one of them high cholesterol they've been associated with some other stuff that seem to be hormone related kind of like bpas in a way actually i think that's how you frighten people like listen if you use this you could get a thyroid disorder and that could wreak <laughs> havoc with your weight ladies and the type of ladies who like wear makeup you know even right. during quarantine 
yeah. which I've heard makeup sales in quarantine were not affected, which means really? that people were just uh, it, like makeup su- did surprisingly well. My wife was telling me that. And That's I, I shocking. Found that sh- yeah, which tells me that either A, like a lot of people were going, still going out to own the libs and getting wearing twice as much makeup. Or B, uh, there just were a lot of loving fathers who let their uh, daughters do their face or something. I don't know. That is that is absolutely crazy. Hey, the quarantine, you could try out new fashions. That or doing wharf makeup, like basically yes. becoming a Cleon, became really big. That movie, The Joker, came out and all the desperate dudes were trying to mimic it. <laughs> All right, we'll take it from Science and the Pussy. Thank you so much for coming back for Science Faction 574, where you learned all about the interesting and weird history of p-values and how your makeup might be poisoning you. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back next week for Science Faction 575. And that has been another great episode of Science and the Pussy. On this episode, we talked about the average dick size in America, and gave Richard Dawkins a prank call. Join us next week on Science and the Pussy. <laughs> You've been listening to Science Function. Wait, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs>